Good morning and welcome to Munich's third quarter 2023 earnings call. My name is Jessica Brew, Head of Investor Relations and Communications at the Munich. I will also be the moderator on today's call. Speaking on the call are Dr. Daniel Fitt, our Chief Executive Officer and President, as well as Glenn Whaley, our Chief Financial Officer. Please note that all participants will be in this only mode and this event is being recorded. After today's presentation, there will be an opportunity to ask questions. If you joined the webcast via the Zoom platform, there are two ways to submit questions. You can either submit your questions in writing via the Q&A tool of the Zoom portal, or if you would like to speak with us directly, please use the raise hand function in the Zoom portal to queue your question. Before we begin, I would like to remind you that this presentation may contain forward-looking statements. Such statements can be identified by words such as may, will, expect, anticipate, estimate, or words with a similar meaning, and such statements involve a number of risks and uncertainties that could cause the Munich's actual results to differ materially from those discussed here. Please note that these forward-looking statements reflect the Munich's opinions only as of the date of this presentation, and it undertakes no obligation to revise or publicly release the result of any revision to these forward-looking statements in light of new information or future events. Please refer to Munich's SEC filings for a more detailed description of the risk factors that may affect the Munich's results and these forward-looking statements. I would now like to turn the call over to our CEO and President, Dr. Daniel Fitt, to begin the presentation. Daniel? Yeah, thank you, Jessica. I would also like to welcome everybody to today's earnings call. Earlier this morning, we announced our financial results for the third quarter ended September 30th, 2023, in our press release and Form 10Q. During the call today, we will walk through our third quarter 2023 and subsequent highlights, financial and operating results, as well as anticipated upcoming milestones. As Jessica noted, after the presentation, you will have the opportunity to ask questions. Let's start with a review of our third quarter 2023 and subsequent highlights. I would like to begin with our video fluidimus calcium development program in multiple sclerosis. In August, we completed enrollment of our phase two caliper trial of video fluidimus calcium in patients with progressive multiple sclerosis or PMS. A total of 467 adult patients with primary MS or active or non-active secondary PMS were randomized to either 45 milligram daily doses of videofodimus calcium or placebo. Patients were enrolled at more than 70 sites in North America, Western, Central, and Eastern Europe. A few months later, in October, we reported overwhelmingly positive interim data from this phase two caliper trial. In total, 203 patients were included in this analysis. The overall population, which includes all subtypes of PMS, saw 22.4% improvement in serofilament light chain of NFL or NFL for videofluidimus calcium over placebo at week 24. We believe that this is a substantial and meaningful difference in favor of videofluidimus calcium in this PMS population. A statistically significant difference was found for serum NFL at week 24 between videofluidimus calcium and placebo with a p-value of 0.01. If you look at our sub uh, of the if you look at the subtypes of progressive MS to the right, you can appreciate that this difference in NFL at week 24 was consistently shown throughout all subtypes of progressive MS. I would like to point out that we saw a 20% reduction for videofluidimus calcium versus placebo in SPMS, meaning the patients with no focal inflammation activity but dis disease progression. This subtype is a difficult to treat population with no relevant FDA approved therapies available. This slide puts our caliper interim data into the perspective of historical third party studies in the same progressive MS subtypes. On the left, we display the data for PPMS compared to the oratorial study for orcalizumab, which, which showed a spread of NFL values between active and placebo at 24 weeks of 12.4%. In the caliper trial, we observed an 18.8% improvement of active drug over placebo in PPMS at week 24. 
The results of this phase three study led to approval of ocalizumab for treatment of PPMS. In the center of the slide, you see historical data for secondary progressive MS, both for non-active and active SPMS. In comparison, Mediflutimus calcium was able to show a substantial reduction of NFL in both the active and non-active populations. To our knowledge, this is the first time that such a substantial effect in NFL has been shown in non-active SPMS patients, again, which is the PMS subtype with the highest unmet medical need. The right side of the slide shows comparison between our phase two emphasis data for Vidofludimus calcium in RRMS versus our historical relapsing MS studies to complete the picture. In summary, we believe the clear separation observed for serum NFL for Vidofludimus calcium over placebo in this PMS patient population represents another major step forward for what potentially could be a first-in-class no one activator for MS. This strong signal also points to a more likely positive outcome of the overall caliper trial, also on clinical relevant endpoints like prevention of disability worsening. In October, Dr. Robert J. Fox from Cleveland Clinic, who is also the coordinating investigator of our Insure and Caliper programs, presented data from our phase two emphasis trial in, of Vitaflumus calcium in RRMS in an e-poster at the joint actums, actums meeting. As a reminder, Vitaflumus calcium showed an improvement in serum NFL in both treatment arms of 30 and 45 milligram over placebo. Just recently, we received a notice of allowance from the USPTO for patent covering the treatment of relapsing MS with a specific dose strength of Vitaflumus calcium. This includes a daily dose of about 10 mg to 45 mg of Vidifluimus calcium and other sorts, as well as the free acid form of the treatment for relapsing MS, also covering the 30 mg dosage used in our ongoing twin phase 3 insurance trials. The claims are expected to provide protection into 2041, unless extended further. This patent significantly bolstered the multi-layered proprietary IP position we have built around our late-stage program for patients with MS. Moving to our IMU 856 program. In July, we hosted a virtual celiac disease expert roundtable to discuss ongoing active celiac disease, or OACD, a serious lifelong autoimmune disorder, and the substantial unmet need for therapeutic solutions. We were grateful and honored to have been joined for this event by the renowned thought leaders from Harvard Medical School, the Mayo Clinic and Celiac Disease Foundation. During the round table, our Chief Medical Officer Andreas also provided an overview of IMU 856 program, including our positive phase one trial results in celiac disease patients released earlier this year in May, which I will highlight again in just a moment. Also in October, we presented two abstracts at the United European Gastroenterology Week, UEGW 2023. My colleague, Dr. Dr. Franziska Vojanik, Senior Medical Director of at Munich, presented data from our positive phase 1B clinical trial of IMU 856 in patients with celiac disease during a moderated poster session. IMU 856 is an orally available and systemically acting small molecule modulator of the target CERT6. The trial results, gathered during periods of gluten free diet and gluten challenge, demonstrated positive effects for IMU 856 over placebo in four key dimensions of celiac disease pathophysiology protection of the gut architecture, improvement of patient symptoms, biomarker response, and enhancement of nutrient absorption. IMU-856 was also observed to be safe and well-tolerated in this trial. We believe that this highly encouraging data provides initial clinical proof of concept for an entirely new therapeutic approach to gastrointestinal disorders by promoting the regeneration of bowel architecture. Additionally, Dr. Gerd de Hans from Uni Amsterdam University Medical Center presented data from our phase two CalDOS-1 trial of Vidifludimus calcium in ulcerative colitis, or UC. As a reminder, the maintenance phase results 
from the Carlos I trial demonstrated statistically significant activity of vitalumous calcium compared to placebo and reaffirmed the drug's favorable safety and tolerability profile. The data validated the potential of vitalumous calcium in UC and other inflammatory bowel disease indications. Earlier this month, Dr. Boyanek had another opportunity to present the data from our phase 1b clinical trial of IMU 856 in patients with celiac disease in a virtual e-poster at the Association of European Celiac Society's General Assembly Conference in Athens, Greece. That concludes our summary for the third quarter 2023 and subsequent highlights. I am very happy that the scientific and clinical advancement and progress made across our different programs has been extremely positive during this year. Immunic is leveraging this momentum now in discussions with pharmaceutical companies. For IMU 856, our goal is to identify a partner who is capable of performing several therapeutic phase two clinical trials. For vitafludimus calcium, the release of our very good biomarker NFL data has been an important trigger point for partnering discussions with global and regional pharma players. I would now like to hand over the call to Glenn to provide financial overview. Glenn? Thank you, Daniel. I will now review the financial and operating results for the third quarter ended September 30th, 2023. Let me start a review of our cash position. We ended the quarter with $59.7 million in cash and cash equivalents. With these funds, we expect to be able to fund operations into September of 2024. Regarding the operating results, R&D expenses were $19.8 million for the three months ended September 30th, 2023, as compared to $16.5 million for the three months ended September 30th, 2022. These costs were mainly driven by external development costs related to the ongoing clinical trials of betaflutamous calcium and personnel expenses. This was partially offset by a decrease in external development costs related to the IMU 935 and IMU 856 programs. For the nine months ended September 30th, 2023, R&D expenses were $63.9 million as compared to $50.5 million for the same period ended September 30th, 2022. These costs were mainly driven by external development costs related to the ongoing clinical trials of vitafludimus calcium, IMU856, and personnel expenses. This was partially offset by a decrease in external development costs related to the phase two clinical trial of vitafludimus calcium and ulcerative colitis and IMU935 program. GNA expenses were $3.8 million for the three months ended September 30th, 2023 as compared to $3.6 million for the same period ended September 30th, 2022. The slight increase was spread across numerous categories. For the nine months ended September 30th, 2023, GNA expenses were $11.9 million as compared to $11.6 million for the same period ended September 30th, 2022. The increase was related to an increase across numerous categories, which was partially offset by a decrease in personnel expense related to stock compensation expense. Other income was $0.8 million for the three months ended September 30th, 2023, as compared to negative $1.1 million for the same period ended September 30th, 2022. The increase was primarily attributable to a decrease in foreign exchange losses and an increase in interest income as a result of higher interest rates. This was partially offset by a decrease in R&D tax incentives as a result of less spend for clinical trials in Australia. For the nine months ended September 30th, 2023, other income was $3.8 million as compared to negative $1.8 million for the same period ended September 30th, 2022. The increase was primarily attributable to an increase in interest income as a result of higher interest rates, a decrease in foreign exchange losses, and a research allowance attributable for tax year 2021 from the German Federal Ministry of Finance that was received in 2023. The increase was partially offset by a decrease in R&D tax incentives as a result of less spend for clinical trials in Australia. The net loss for the three months ended September 30th, 2023 was approximately $22.8 million, or $0.51 cents per basic and diluted share, based on approximately $44.6 million weighted average common shares outstanding, compared to a net loss of approximately $21.2 million, or $69 cents per basic and diluted share 
based on approximately 30.6 million weighted average common shares outstanding. The same period ended September 30th, 2022. Net loss for the nine months ended September 30th, 2023 was approximately 72 million or $1.63 per basic and diluted share based on 44.2 million weighted average common shares outstanding. Compared to a net loss of approximately 63.9 million or $2.16 per basic and diluted share, based on 29.7 million weighted average common shares outstanding for the same period ended September 30th, 2022. With that, I will turn the call back over to Daniel for a review of our upcoming clinical milestones. Daniel? Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you, Glenn. I would like to provide an update on the anticipated upcoming milestones for our clinical development programs. Our current expectation is to report top-line data from our Phase two caliper trial in Progressive MS in April 25. Additionally, we expect to report an interim fertility analysis of our Phase three insure program late next year to read out the first of our identical twin Phase three insure trials in relapsing MS at the end of 2025. As stated before, based on the strong clinical activity of SERPs so far, and with the Fludimus calcium solidly established safety and tolerability profile to date, we believe that the design of the phase three insure program will provide a straightforward path to a potential regulatory approval in relapsing MS. If top line caliper data continues to show neuroprotective effects for PMS patients, we may be able to position with the Fludimus calcium as the first oral treatment for non active secondary progressive MS as well. We also expect the drug's potential first-in-class ability to activate NOR1 to meaningfully benefit the ongoing phase 3 insured trials in relapsing MS. With regard to our IMU-856 program, as previously reported, we have begun preparing for a phase 2 clinical trial and ongoing active celiac disease patients. We are very excited about this data and believe IMU-856 could represent an entirely new therapeutic approach to gastrointestinal disorders by promoting the regeneration of bowel architecture without the serious consequences associated with immunosuppressive therapies. This brings us to the end of our formal presentation. Jessica, please open the call for the Q&A session. Yeah, thank you, Daniel, and also Glenn for walking us through the third quarter and subsequent highlights, as well as our upcoming value inflection points. We will now begin the question and answer session as a reminder, if you joined the webcast via the Zoom platform, there are two ways to submit questions. You can either submit your questions in writing via the Q&A tool of the Zoom portal, or if you would like to speak with us directly, please use the raise hand function of the Zoom portal to queue your question. And our first guest today is Caroline Pocher from Wetbush Packraw. Caroline, please unmute yourself and go ahead. Hi, good morning. This is Caroline on for Andreas. Thank you for taking our questions. Um, just a few from us. Um, can you provide any insight into where you are in terms of preparing for the phase two trial for 856 and celiac disease? What do you anticipate the trial design would look like and the timelines for when you think you would initiate the trial? Yeah, I think as as we have stated before, um, we we have fully evaluated the data, done our homework on completion the data packages. So this is work in progress right now, and um, maybe some some thoughts um, on the trial design. So um, likely this will be a, should be a treatment phase of uh, three months of treatment in ongoing active celiac disease patients. Um, so a, a trial which also make it possible to really um, conclude data for further testing down the road um, in pivotal trials. Um, yeah, and uh, more or less that, that's where we are right now. We're still in the in the preparation pro uh, process. Okay, great. Um, and then just one follow up from us. Can you talk about how enrollment is progressing in the insure program and what your target timeline is to complete enrollment? Yeah, I think we're, as you know, we usually don't give a um, a rolling update on on the recruitment status, um, but we keep currently our our guidance of completion of enrollment in the way that we are able to read out the first of the insure studies end of twenty five, and the second one a couple of months later. So that's, okay. that's all I can say. 
Okay, great. Thank you so much and congrats on the progress. Thank, Thank you, Caroline. You. Um, our next guest is uh, Liam Heaster from Piper Sandler. Liam, please unmute yourself and go ahead. Hi, um, I'm calling, I'm asking a question on behalf of Yasmin Rahimi, um, just two questions. So my first one is related to the Caliper trial. So what type of data are you expecting to report in April 2025 20, and what's the bar of success expected for the readout? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question because I think we have spoken a lot about this really strong NFL data. So of course we will, also report NFL as a secondary readout um, from the study. Um, but I think the, the most interesting endpoints will be the primary endpoint, which is um, brain volume change in patients comparing active with placebo as a primary endpoint, or brain atrophy, maybe that's the right word for that. And um, the, another, maybe the most important um, secondary endpoint or key secondary endpoint is um, confirmed disability worsening, so a change in EDS score um, in a confirmed way. So that also will give us, and that's I think important, the, the ability to, to correlate the changes in biomarkers and clinical endpoints as well at the same time. So that's all planned to be able to be released in April 25. Great, and is there a specific like, bar of success that you're looking for? Well, it, 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 if you look on what's currently on the market, I think the bar is not super high here. I think we we want to see a benefit on all of those endpoints. But um, if we more or less translate what we have seen in the, in the NFL data set into the full data readout, that would be wonderful. And also a, a uh, meaningful medical difference in disability prevention would be maybe the best thing, the best win here specifically looking on those untreatable patient populations. So looking specifically on the uh, secondary progressive patients without focal inflammation, without relapses. So the non-active secondary progressive population, I think any benefit here would be great. Um, and I, I can't give you really hard numbers here at that point. It will, I, I think the study was, was designed to be powered for brain atrophy benefit so that that is something we want to achieve on a statistical readout here. Thank you. And then just one more question, just to build off of the previous one. Well, actually, and related to that IMU 856. Um, have you spoken with the FDA at all um, with phase two design, or is it still just in the preliminary stage? This is an this is a process which is ongoing right now. Um, okay. So usually what we do is we submit um our IND filing, and then you have written communication with the regulators on, for example, protocol design and so forth. Great, thank you. Thank you, Liam. Um, the next one here in the queue is Matt Kaplan from Ladenburg Talman. Matt, please unmute yourself and go ahead. Hey, good morning, guys, and uh, thanks for taking the questions. Um, just wanted to focus a little bit on your business development goals. You mentioned during the, the prepared remarks can you talk a little bit more, more about that for 856 uh, and, and uh, also eight, uh, 858? Yeah, thank you, Matt. And um, thank you for that question. Of course, the, the, here we have several good assets and good data. So uh, you remember this year was full of good data readouts with the celiac data, um, with um, um, the Caldo's maintenance data, and now with the, with the Caliper data. And all of these data typically are good, good points to intensify discussions with companies. It's difficult to really say exactly what comes first, what is the best option, but I think what we're trying is to make sure we use the data in our active discussions to, to really build a level of trust and, um, and a good discussion with potential partners. And based on that, then to to execute the one or the other deal. Um, so I think the, the best description would be that we are building more optionality on that, and to um, have also access to some non-dilutive financing sources to fuel the rest of the pipeline. Based on that. Okay. Okay. Thanks. And then you mentioned in terms of some new IP. What what is that? The new IP that was uh, allowed. What what does that uh, get you in terms of uh, uh, exclusivity period? 
Yeah, I think that's that's a that's a good point. So that patent um, runs until thirty eight. So it's a patent which covers the dose strength and the treatment of of relapsing MS, and um, it is uh, it's covered this the certain dose strengths here and would protect us until thirty eight plus patent term extension. But there's a potential to patent term extension there, which would then protect us until forty one. Um, uh, no, no, sorry, I mixed that up. No, I think this pattern goes. No, to... 41 is correct. 41 is correct, yeah. yeah. <laughs> sorry. So 41 is the right number here. Um, and, but we have more things in the making, so that's why. Yeah. And, then, we have more and then to report later. <laughs> okay. Uh, great. And then um the you've been you know characterizing the the um um uh, vitiflumus. As well, in terms of its its ability to be a neuro one activator, what does what does that mean uh, from the point of view of, of the uh, uh, the drug as well? Yeah, I'm very thankful for this question because that's maybe the that, that's maybe the elephant in the room on the MS treatment landscape. I think the the thing is that so far in in MS we have good options to treat relapses. Um, on the one hand, and we have very good drugs on doing that and reducing inflammation. What is maybe the the, the the missing piece is really to protect neurons from impairment, from cell death by triggers and signals which are independent of focal inflammation. So something which, for example, is happening patients once they progress from relapsing MS into secondary progressive MS where relapses go down, but still disability is there. And with the data we have obtained and um, in, in combination with literature data and work other groups have done in the scientific community, we believe that no one is a target which may give us here a signal, a protective signal for neurons in a way which is independent of that focal inflammation. And combining the new one activation now with our known and well-reported DHODH inhibition, I think this drug has a kind of like a double strike on the two important pieces for treating relapses, relapsing MS here on inflammation and direct neuroprotection. Whereas the, in, it also offers now, and this was, I think, the conclusion we draw from the NFL uh, reduction, uh, also offers a treatment option for those so far untreatable patients of um, PMS, specifically primary progressive and uh, non-active secondary progressive in this. And just to be clear, this is, this is something that's totally separate from the DHOD inhibitor, inhibiting yeah. effects and, and not, not and unique to, to no. plutofluminous and not characteristic of, of other DHODH no, it's not, Exactly. It's not linked to DHODH. It's something which is a, a property of the molecule and its binding ability um, to both to DHODH on the one hand and to no one on the other hand. We have we have published a paper earlier this year together with our academic collaborators um, around Daniel Merck, um, showing that the drug directly binds. There's an ICT data there in this in this paper showing that the molecule is directly binding to no one um, as a protein. Perfect. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Daniel. Pleasure. Thank you, Matt. Uh, yeah, maybe to follow up on Matt's question regarding BD, um, we received two questions here in writing via the Q&A tool, um, which go into a similar direction. Um, the first one, please describe your strategy for maintaining adequate liquidity to see these opportunities through to fruition. And the second one, create clinical results. What's the plan to raise cash? Maybe, Danny, you can give your strategic Thoughts here again. Yeah, of course, uh, that's that's an important piece to make sure we we earn the fruits at the end of the day, and therefore we think it's worth to follow um, different ways to 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 fund the company for the next years. And as I said, one of the important pieces could be business development activity, partnering um, on one on one of the assets, or maybe even on, on on two or some territorial partnerships could also be an option. Uh, another option is kind of non-dilutive financing, for example, coming from project financing. And the third one could be any kind of equity financing. So I think we keep those options on the table, um, but also considering the, what's going on in the capital markets. Yeah, thank you, Daniel. Uh, our next live guest here is Tom Smith from Leering Partners. Tom, please unmute yourself and go ahead. 
Great. Hey guys, good morning. Thanks for morning. taking the questions. Morning. I was just wondering um, if there's any update on the early pipeline programs like IMU 381, and uh, do you have any visibility on timing for advancing this program into the clinic or um, when we can expect to learn more on this asset? Yeah, uh, thank you, Tom, for the, for the question. Um, I think um, the program was initiated based on, on positive data we generated from the Caldos trial. Um, but clearly the company is prioritizing now the clinical programs right now um, for time and resource reasons. So uh, we we have the all the preparation work ongoing, uh, part of that completed. Um, but clearly the, the resource focus and the progress um, of the company is focusing on performing next steps and continuing the, the trials for beta fluid scar cement for 856 right now. Got it. That's helpful. And if um, I could just follow up on uh, an earlier question, just on the 856 DLAX study, are, are there any specific gating factors, Daniel, that, that you would call out, I guess, in terms of, of getting that program off the ground and um, getting the IND cleared and starting to enroll patients there? No, as, as mentioned, we are preparing the trial. That means also um, physically preparing the trial on the material side, so production of material for the trials and so forth. Um, and um, we have also stated that our priority will be celiac disease as, as first indication that we're trying to, to look at. But it's also a little bit linked to the other question we have answered um, you know, already today is that we also think about partnering could make sense to also broaden development beyond celiac disease. So this is something which is also an important aspect to consider in any um, priorities, speed going forward and so forth with the program. So, so far, this is still all in preparation, also the interaction of the regulators. Um, and this is not just limited to, to the US, it goes also into European regulators um, to really make sure we have a good trial prepared um, also discussing with the uh, with our KOL network on on the different aspects of having a good trial set up to make sure we read all proper data. We don't um, fall on our own over our own feet here. Um, we can learn a lot from other trials in in that um, world of celiac disease treatments. So I think it's. It's going forward, and as soon as we we are making the next steps, I think we will update the market on that. Understood. That makes sense. All right. Thanks for taking the question. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Tom. Uh, just as a reminder, if you have a question, please use the raise hand function of the Zoom portal or the Q&A tool. And we have one more here who wants to be with us live, which is Mayank Mamtani from B. Riley. Mayank, please unmute yourself. Hi, this is actually William on from my own today. Congratulations on the uh, really nice third quarter results. Um, I think just one from us on your NFL data from Caliper. Um, you know, A, it looks really, really nice. You've got uh, it's really nice data across all subpopulations, uh, including this, the, the broader popula uh, PMS population. I'm curious slightly about um, the active SPMS. Um, got a pretty low end there, and and I'm just kind of curious how we should think about the sort of the smaller number there. Um, but then also when we're doing when we get to the final readout, um, will you be looking at these subpopulations um, and trying to figure out exactly your path forward, potentially choosing one subset uh, over the other for then going into the to the phase three or for or uh, potentially for partnering activities? Are you really trying to keep this as uh, a, a PMS, more of a broader drug? Just trying to sort of figure out your path forward there. Appreciate it. Thank you for that question. I think that's not something important we should touch on um, because I think this is more, what is the track towards any regulatory approval later? Um, and how do we prioritize things? I think we have been very excited specifically on the data for the, as I mentioned, for the non-active population, which is really the one in the PPMS population and the non-active secondary progressive populations. The active populations had responded very nicely to NFL, but I think in the in the US, in, in the in the space of the FDA regulated um, treatments, 
they fall into RMS basically. So therefore, if, if we focus on US treatments, they this is covered by our uh, insure study basically. Um, and therefore, if we focus on PMS, we will mainly discuss and, and go forward with those patients where there is little or no um, relapse activity remaining. Um, by the way, this is what the, 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 you mentioned the subpopulation of active patients that also conf, re, reconfirms what we have seen in the emphasis phase two study on, on those patients. So I think it's also a nice uh, confirmation of the RMS population that you have generated earlier. Um, but if it's if it comes to the to the to the best indication going forward, I think um, we definitely need to and want to pick the best choice for regulatory approval. And I think this is more or less dictated by two things: by our data and the unmet need. And I think this clearly is in non-active secondary and progressive. There is no no real treatment available right now for patients. And our data was so good there as well on the NFL side that we think it is likely the, the indication of choice. Of course, we first want to look on the data in April 25 to see if we see the same clinical signals as we have seen on the NFL, we don't. I appreciate that, it's very helpful and uh, congratulations again. Thank you, Will. Thank you. Yeah, this actually concludes our question and answer session. I would like to turn the conference back over to Daniel for any closing remarks. Yeah, thanks, Jessica. And thank you, today's attendees, for your insightful questions. In summary, with the completion of enrollment of our phase two caliper trial, the positive interim data from the caliper trial, as well as the continuation of enrollment of the ensure phase three trial, we have continued to make tangible progress on the clinical development of fetus calcium during this past quarter. As progress is made, we also expect to provide an update on our preparations for a phase two clinical trial of IMGHF6 in patients with ongoing active celiac disease. With that, I would like to close today's call. Thank you very much for joining, and we are happy to answer any additional questions one-on-one. -on -one. Thank you for joining in the next third quarter 2023 earnings call. The call has now concluded. You may now disconnect.